Ahoy, you salty sailors. Time to raise anchor and set sail for your best scrawny life. Arr! Alright, our speaking spotlight for this episode is Allium Tricocum, the wild leek, sometimes called a wide leek, and sometimes called ramps. And in this photo you can see the bulb and also the umbel of the flowering head that came up last year. And it has the red, that little bit of red coloration on the stem. The leaves will die back once the tree canopy is fully grown out. The leaves of the wild leeks die back and then it sends up its seed head. So another important identifying characteristic is if a plant has flowers and leaves at the same time, it's not wild leeks. So there's a lot of lily family members that are emerging at this time. Some of them are toxic, some deadly poisonous, and some are edible. To differentiate between wild leeks and something that could be deadly poisonous, let's say lily of the valley, is both that reddish coloration on the stem and the fact that wild leeks do not have flowers and leaves at the same time. Also they have a strong smell of leeks or onions. So let's get after those morels, but first let's just do a little reminder here about our old friend poison ivy that's what it looks like this time of year you don't want to avoid that just assume that your clothes have poison ivy on it when you get home from picking morel mushrooms uh, put them in the laundry with a little bit of bleach that should take care of the the uh, oils so here we are with a uh, mushroom known as devil murdered and also a newly emerged morel Usually those devil's urns are an early indicator that you're a little too early for morels. But in this case they were just starting. Now one of the other mushrooms you may find is Coprinellus micaceus, the mica cat. These will emerge around the base of uh, dead trees, elm trees primarily. Um, they are edible, I've never tried them. Uh, they are one of the ink cat mushrooms so they will deliquesce they'll produce that black uh, spore liquid. <clears throat> and of course, uh, pheasant back mushrooms are out this time of year too. They are also edible if picked when they're young and, and pliable and sliced quite thin. Not really a choice edible, definitely not uh, on the same level as a morel. Now one of the other things you may find this time of year are false morels. These are several species of mushrooms from the genus Gyromitra. In this case, Gyromitra brunea. Uh, brunea has this three, these three discs or lobe. And the man who got me interested in, in investigating these mushrooms, you know, of course we both had learned these mushrooms as Gyromitra esculenta, which does contain a dangerous amount of the toxin Gyromitra. He claimed to have been eating it his entire life and never had any problems, and indeed he was in fairly good health for his age. I mean, he was, he was over retirement age and doing pretty well. But I think most likely the species down in, in uh, southern Missouri was Gyromitra caroliniana, which recent studies show that it has much less Gyromitra than the European Esculenta that's below what would be harmful to humans. Now, do I recommend people going out and foraging these mushrooms on a regular basis? Not really. We don't completely know the long-term effects of exposure to Gyromitra. They do taste good, uh, very comparable to morels. If you do want to try to eat them, I recommend starting very small. I started out, you know, just doing a basic edibility test, doing just eating just a little bit, well cooked. Then I'd eat just a little bit more. So at the most, I'd probably eaten like two caps 
uh, trimmed down, you know, trimmed uh, all, the, all the dirt and so forth trimmed off. And it had no ill effects. But like I said, we don't. it's not really well known what the long term effects are. And here we're back with the uh, Gyromitra brunea, which seems to be the most common type here in Iowa. It's, they seem to prefer well decayed logs uh, in good contact with the ground. Uh, a lot of times where I'm finding these mushrooms is where a tree has fallen over a trail and then the park uh, managers have come and cut down the tree. They've cut off the branches so it lies flat and they've pushed it to the side of the trail. Um, most of the Gyromitra brunea that I've ever found have been around human-made uh, log piles or just logs that have been uh, cut down and, and pushed to the side of a trail. So they're, they make more contact with the ground than um, one, a tree that just falls over normally would, at least not for, for quite some time. But yes, yeah, you can see the well-decayed log um, and in this case, they had done a prescribed burn. There was a fire there. But I don't think that had much to do with the emergence of these mushrooms. Because just on the other side of the trail, it had not been burned. And there were still uh, Jagermitra brunea over there. If you had a dry year, then look lower in the valleys down towards the stream beds and so forth. Uh, if you've had a decent amount of rain, then you're likely to find them on the ridge tops. Alright, so here is a rare spring ephemeral wildflower. Um, you can look this up in your field guide, Miss Petra, and see if your field guide even has this one. It might not. You've probably never seen it. You would probably need to go up to the edge of the driftless area. Uh, maybe at Palisades Kepler Park or Wapsipinikin State Park to be able to find this flower in, in the prairie area where you live now. It does, they don't, it's not really, it doesn't really grow there. So you've probably never seen it. We know Sarah's never seen it for sure. And it might be rare enough that your field guy doesn't even have it. But that's the showy orchis. One of the more unusual spring ephemerals we get here. Alright, so back on the Morel Trail, let's check Lake Red Rock. And we got uh, an old elm tree that's been cut down. There's a dead one still standing. It's not like it used to be a long time ago where there were just a lot of, of uh, dead elves that were still standing when you were first seeing the, the uh, Dutch elves. So they're, they're hard to find now. Uh, you can still find some elves that produce some But cottonwoods. Uh, or also, if you find a cottonwood that's uh, been killed by beavers, that, that can be uh, a productive spot. And of course, sycamores, like we've mentioned before, will also produce more mushrooms. But they live so long, it's hard to find a, a dead sycamore. But uh, if you do, that uh, definitely take note of it. Got this. You know, left it look past all this blue cohosh to find the morel. The blue cohosh out there is just uh, nearly overwhelming. Uh, this is Morchella punctipes. That, uh, it's an edible morel as well. Uh, it's more likely to grow saprotrophically just from forest litter. So you can just find those in random areas that accumulate a lot of leaves and so, so forth, and gullies and so forth in the forest. The regular morel does sometimes grow saprotrophically. In my experience, when that happens, it's mostly associated with flooding. If there is an area that was flooded during morel season, if you return to that area the next year, you 
may find large numbers of Morchella americana growing saprotrophically from bee fitter. Um, but in general, the americanas are going to be associated with a tree that they have uh, been symbiotically related with during their, their lifespan. It's only once the tree dies and their, their food supply is cut off that they begin to uh, send up fruiting bodies. So if there's another punk of bees I was finding, just kind of finding them randomly every so often. That, that blue cohosh out there is just out of control. Out of control with the blue cohosh. Alright, well, you get down below all that. There, there is one, I guess, eventually. Yes, the Americana, pretty distinctive. Uh, it is completely hollow inside, which would differentiate, differentiate it from the false morels, the gyromitra. Here's another look at the poison ivy. That's what that blue cohosh looks like in bloom. Uh, there we have, uh, have a few of the Americanas just to give you the idea of what they're all about. The punctipedes, the name comes from these uh, little spikes uh, that uh, appear on the stem of the mushroom. And it's so also sometimes called the half-free morel. The cap is not, uh, part of the cap is not attached to the stem. Uh, if you get into where there are some oaks, you may find wood that's stained with chlorus aborea uh, stains. That's a fungal stain <clears throat> and of course we are starting to see the yellow oysters now this mushroom most often emerges in the fall but this is a spring fruiting of it that is the deadly gallerina it is deadly poison it grows from well decayed logs directly from the wood it has a very faint ring around the stem it produces a brown spore so the way to differentiate it between uh, let's say Flamulina volupes would be that Flamulina volupes produces a white spore dust and the Gallerina marginata produces a brown spore dust. Looking at Morcello Americana. Gonna you know, set some rice in the rice cooker here. Because I didn't have very many, just mixed the chopped morels with the rice once it was done. And added a little salt and then into the pan just to get a little browning. And that turned out uh, it takes a little bit, you know, at first it kind of wants to stick a little bit. I, I did use quite a bit of ghee. Uh, but uh, once you get that kind of browning going, then it will release from the pan. You can flip it around. Uh, and uh, that was delicious. That was a 10 out of 10 for sure. Really simple. Um, I can't call it fried rice. Uncle Roger would get mad because I didn't use leftover rice, but... Uh, uh, we call it, we'll call it ancestors crying uh, morel rice, and uh, yeah, that's that's uh, that's one for the recipe book there. That is delicious, super simple, easy to do, and really good.